Thank you, Fernanda, for that introduction and coordinating this webinar. I'm Joel Draffin, and as I just mentioned, this is the second cybersecurity webinar, and it deals with technical approaches to improve cybersecurity for the smart grid. Before we start the details of our presentation, I thought I would quickly cover what the International Smart Grid Action Network is, where it is, and what it does. On this slide, you can see in the green box that under the auspices of the International Energy Agency, it's a platform to support high-level government action for the accelerated deployment of smarter, cleaner electricity grids. The International uh, Smart Grid Action Network, as you can see, is a worldwide um, representation with 25 um, representatives representing countries throughout the world. Improved electric grids is an issue for all countries, and people from more than 60 countries have registered for today's webinar. The Smart Grid has many different activities I will touch on them today. You'll find many of the slides have more details than we're going to cover today, and that's primarily for your reference after the, the call. But having gotten started with the first one, which was uh, a global inventory, it has a number of different pieces, and today we're working with the number eight, which is the ISCAN Academy, and that's where the webinars are being held. For today, we'll be talking about cybersecurity challenges, the approach and best practices. We'll have three case studies, talk about cyber professionals and constraints, then mention measure success and conclusions. As discussed in our first cybersecurity webinar in June, which is available for download, if you wish, um, one of the challenges is technology, the highly interdependent connected platforms the machine-level distributed control, the new intelligent devices are changing the way smart grids are operating and becoming more sophisticated. Second, major challenge is the changing business models. As you have distributed energy resources, of wind and solar, with intermittent behavior, you have desire for individual control of subunits, you have demand changes, you have dynamic pricing with time of day and locational marginal pricing. And you have new actors, new suppliers of energy, new people that aggregate energy demand. So there's a number of technology and market changes. The challenge for us, and we'll be mentioning today, is managing the challenges of cybersecurity. You have evolving threats, hacking groups, nation states, and we touched upon a number of these threats in the previous in the first uh, webinar. You need best practices. Standards are not sufficient. You need to have agility. You need to have, uh, and you have to understand the forensics and how you operate and evaluate an operational system may be different than an IT system in the business application. And one of the major challenges is how much should you spend? What kind of cybersecurity expenditures are sufficient? And how do you use a risk-based management analysis to effectively deploy the resources you have available? And I'd like to turn it over to uh, David Batts to talk about some of the approaches we're taking. Uh, thank you, Cyril. I appreciate the introduction. In today's world, we recommend that entities, uh, utilities, government agencies that are looking to uh, deploy smart grid solutions, think about managing the threats and the risks in a holistic fashion. That they consider uh, both the, the types of end users who are going to be utilizing some of this advanced technology, and that they consider carefully uh, to what degree the, the associated risks for deployment of new technologies uh, matches or is contemplated uh, in alignment with uh, investment. So to make sure that the benefit of a particular discrete smart grid investment 
matches the potential cost or risk. Fundamentally, one of the one of the major issues that entities should be concerned with is not only uh, planning and thinking about uh, cyber risk, but also to contemplate a incident response plan proactively. So even before a bad event happens, to think about how they might respond to uh, an attack or a particular uh, vulnerability. One of the major uh, opportunities that I see is for entities to use a cybersecurity management framework. We're going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. In addition, when contemplating deployment of smart grid technology, and this is really for both the entities that are deploying as well as uh, vendors and manufacturers, is to think about how to build and have in place a, uh, a, a way for entities to report and disclose vulnerabilities. In the old days, this used to be called responsible vulnerability disclosure. But in today's world, the term of art is coordinated vulnerability disclosure. As a general matter, most security researchers are very, uh, very keen on the idea of working closely with vendors for vulnerability disclosure. However, they don't want to be uh, sued. They don't want litigation. They don't want to be uh, accused of uh, being a bad actor when they're simply trying to make vulnerabilities known to either manufacturers or those who are implementing a particular smart grid program. Um, when we talk about a federal response framework, it is appropriate to think about how to uh, consider this not only within the context of the energy or electricity provider, but also within the greater community. So, so as to consider uh, civil institutions, for example, water, wastewater facilities, uh, hospitals where various uh, at-risk populations may be housed, and to think about those types of entities within the context of their overall risk assessment. Finally, it's very important that entities uh, have, have thought about how to build their capabilities with respect to cybersecurity and incident response and threat management. Moving to the next slide, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, maturity models. There are a wide variety of maturity models that are available for any party who has interest. I am going to highlight for a couple of minutes a maturity model put forth by the United States Department of Energy and the name of the model is a little bit complicated uh, because the issue is complicated, but it is called the Electricity Subsector Cybersecurity Capability Maturity Model. It's a long name, but it addresses a number of very important factors when contemplating cybersecurity. I will also mention that this electricity subsector cybersecurity capability maturity model is, has been used as a reference case for natural gas as well. There may be initiatives to use this capability maturity model for other critical infrastructures as well. Let's take a look at some of the components that are within the maturity model. The maturity model addresses 10 different domains. And these domains are very, uh, very important within the context of 
cybersecurity. I will discuss a couple of them and just highlight them, um, but each of them is, is worthy of consideration in its own right. The first thing that I'd like to talk about within these 10 domains is the issue of asset change and configuration management. As a general matter, asset management and change configuration, these are extremely important foundational activities for entities to consider as they contemplate uh, deploying any type of, of computer system. One of the challenges with asset management, change management, configuration management is these topics are not very, how do I say, exciting. They, they almost seem to be boring, but I would suggest to you for your consideration is that if you as an entity, if you do not have a handle on the computer systems that are part of your system, if you don't have a handle on, for example, the smart, smart grid or smart meter deployment, if you are unable to effectively uh, plan for, implement changes and configuration changes, including having the ability to roll back discrete changes, then I would suggest it is going to be very challenging for you to be successful in this space. Now, I just wanted to take those few minutes to highlight one aspect, uh, asset change and configuration management. However, um, the other nine cybersecurity practices are very worthy of your consideration and review. One of the things that we've been uh, focused on in the United States lately are issues related to supply chain and external dependencies management, as well as workforce management. Perhaps you have observed in your area how challenging it is to find qualified, experienced cybersecurity practitioners. Uh, we think fundamentally it is going to be important to continue to invest in these types of people to be able to stay on top of these issues. Another area that we think is useful to keep in mind is that there are some very significant differences between, I will say, classic information technology systems versus operational technology systems. Within the context of classic information technology systems, so we could think of those as corporate systems such as email, accounting, billing, payroll, those types of things, as a general matter, uh, attributes such as confidentiality are the most important. However, this is very different for operations technology. And when I'm talking about operations technology, I'm talking about things like supervisory control and data acquisition systems, systems that are employed to literally control physical systems, such as literally controlling the generation or controlling distribution circuits or transmission circuits. In this case, for operations technology, fundamentally, availability is the most key. These systems need to be operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we have found that sometimes there is a little bit of challenge or breakdown between practitioners in these two different spaces. Moving to the approaches that may basically uh, improve cybersecurity, Europe made an attempt and is still undergoing 
uh, through what is called the Clean Energy Package, uh, which is also called uh, Clean Energy for All Europeans. Uh, this is a set of legislative proposals which basically put the emphasis on a smarter and more efficient management of the grid EU level. So not only on the member states of Europe, but at the, with a wider scope. Uh, it's focusing mainly on innovation, which is part of the core package of all these, and uh, it, it is touching renewable energy uh, through legislation and efficiency together with uh, a new market design proposal, which comes after what was called the third energy package. Uh, together with, for example, new rules for uh, efficiency in the buildings. All this package is adding and acknowledge the importance of cybersecurity, which is fundamental to keep the electricity sector and the energy sector more in general at a certain level of assurance. The need of having uh, and managing cyber risks is embedded into all these regulations. The more important part is that uh, into the package, it was also included the adoption of uh, technical measures and also the adoption of technical rules, which are called uh, network codes, which would allow to establish a certain level of cyber security once the regulation will be, uh, will be adopted uh, by the Council and the Parliament in Europe. One, one very important aspect is that all these started uh, more than five years ago. And one important aspect has been over the years that uh, many experts have been working through this. Uh, in this slide, you see which have been the challenges that been identified a few months ago by an expert group which has been working for this for almost a year. Let's mention some of them. In Europe, most of the problems were due basically by the grid stability and by the interconnection at cross-border level. Mainly no member state or few member states may survive without the others into a system which is highly integrated. There is a big importance also uh, for what may be the effects of cyber attacks which were not considered, for example, at the time of the creation of the grid in Europe. There are new technologies which have been introduced, which obviously create vulnerabilities which were not seen before. There are other problems, such as outsourcing of infrastructure, services related to the infrastructure. Let's talk about uh, telecommunications, which are an important part of smart grids, and sometimes outsource to other companies to other utilities just because it's not possible to have those services within the umbrella of, of services offered by the utility. There is an increase in interdependency among market players in the EU systems, mainly ESOs and TSOs have to work together to keep stability of the grid and they have to work together also to keep cybersecurity at a certain level. One big issue, as Dave said a few minutes ago, is availability of resources, human resources with their competencies. We will see it later. This is a crucial point to achieve a minimum level of cybersecurity. And if we want that technical approaches that we apply to improve cybersecurity are effective. There are also some constraints because said a few seconds ago, basically there is a contrast between the real-time availability and the availability requirements of the grid. Moving forward, basically the European Union has set a number of regulations over the years which have been trying to help in defining uh, a good approach towards a decent level of cybersecurity for all Europe. Starting for, from the EU cybersecurity strategy, which was drafted and uh, then uh, given out on 2013, uh, it was 
present with some basic principles which could help mainly to define which are the basic points on which we may build our cyber resilience. Together with this, the digital single market strategy defined the importance of the digital markets at the same level as the standard markets on which we exchange, for example, goods. In Europe, we have mainly 50, in uh, the reports that we have presented, we have mainly 50 national cybersecurity strategies, which covers most of the states, not only in Europe, but also outside. Those 50 strategies have different priorities. Even within the same European uh, frame, we found that some of them were setting different priorities among the different countries. There is also some legislation which has been set to establish a minimum level of cybersecurity. The most important, most probably, is the Network and Information Security Directive. The Network and Information Security Directive is, uh, plays a key role in the strategy of Europe towards cybersecurity, also for electricity, or mainly for what we have called uh, essential services and essential service providers. Basically, it, it establishes the need to set a strategy at national level uh, for cybersecurity. Secondly, it establishes the need to have a cooperation group which at a strategic level would assume and would, and would give out all the principles on which all the strategies should be uh, drafted. And another point is that it will focus on incident management and giving the possibility to establish, giving the obligation to establish certs together with the need to give the availability to communicate to each other, exchanging information about incidents and cyber incidents in Europe. Another important point in the legislation has been the establishment of a contractual public-private partnership. Uh, with a, a budget of 1. billion euros, basically the role of this public-private partnership is to set technical uh, rules and technical standards which may help the progression of all these measures. In addition, we have other legislations which cover several aspects, for example, the security of supply in electricity and gas, and the general data protection regulation, which instead covers data protection for all the Europeans. In this respect, we have an additional document which I want to mention, which is the Data Protection Impact Assessment Template, which was developed by the Directorate General uh, of energy together with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and which address basically a way to assess data protection within the grid. Starting from the challenges, we had the need to understand which were the strategic priorities. And this was a crucial point for us, just to give out all the points which should have been put in a, strategy, in a strategy and ordered by strategic areas. First big point has been to set up an effective threat and risk management system, which includes several strategic areas. Let's see some of them. The first is basically to make sure that the European threat and landscape and risk landscape are aligned, that all the grid can understand and can evaluate the same, in the same way threats and risks. The identification of providers of essential services, as it was described in the Network Information Security Directive, has to be aligned as well, because we need to have common rules as we are in a common market and we are all interconnected. There are also best practices for information exchange. And beyond this, we need to foster international cooperation because we noticed that while at EU level it was 
most probably sufficient to talk among member states, it would have been useful to talk, for example, to the United States government to gain some information about the incidents which are suffered elsewhere. We just shouldn't forget that when we have a cyber incident, most probably this may pop up somewhere else in the world. Another important aspect has been to set up an effective cyber defense framework. For this, we have several strategic areas, mainly a cyber response framework which has been defined or drafted and crisis management, which has been added lately to the clean energy for all Europeans, where basically there are plans to recover from, to tackle crisis and to recover from those crises at EU level and to manage all this. But we need also to continuously improve cyber resilience. We need, we established that we needed a, a European cyber security maturity framework which doesn't necessarily mean that we need a standard which is different from the US, but we need to assess to which level we are, to which level our operators are working, and where they aim to, uh, to which level they aim to get to the end of a certain path. Another important aspect uh, is supply chain integrity framework for the components used in the grids. We couldn't assure that the grid was secure without making sure that all the single components would have been secured on their own and would have been tested. Also, we need some best practices on information exchange among the operators. And obviously, an awareness campaign at EU level, just to make sure that everybody has in mind which are the issues and which may be the outcome of cyber attacks and cyber incidents. And then, as we have told before, we notice that we have to build capacity. And this is a strategic area because we need to build capacity both in terms of technology and human resources. Now, if we consider this, and if we start evaluating what happened since the report, between 2017 and 2018, other things were uh, moving. First of all, the EU cybersecurity strategy is under review and it's foreseen to be released quite soon. So we are waiting for it and we will see what will be in the strategy and then it will be reflected into the strategies for the electricity sector and for the energy sector more in general. Some countries already reviewed their own strategies. Germany, for example, has been reviewed in 2006. 16. Another important thing is that, as we said before, the strategies are expected to be reviewed as a result of the Network Information and Security Directive. If we look to best practices in Europe, there are several best practices, but none of them is comprehensive at the level that we would like to see. If you want some examples, for example, big TSOs and some DSOs are already applying standards which are out of there. And mainly, they mostly apply the ISO uh, 27000 serial standard, and some of them, even the NERC CIP standards, they do without having an obligation of doing that, just because they want to set minimum requirements which may help them basically to achieve a minimum level of security because they have understood the risk they are running. BSI is a reference in Germany and is just providing all the, mem all the lands in Germany with many information about use of cyber security measures just to protect their own environment, also on energy with the help of the regulator. ANSI released a very interesting document which I really suggest you to go through, which is the French CIIP framework. It is extremely simple and it allows all the, all the utilities to go through this document and to set minimum measures which may solve 
most of the problems related to cybersecurity. In addition to this, we have ANISA, which is working at EU level with a number of publications every year, with a number of reports related to cybersecurity to the smart grids. Most of them pre provide recommendations and analysis at EU level, and they are the results of interviews from many experts from the European landscape and also from the international landscape. All this is completed by the work of DG Energy and the wonderful work done by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, which is also doing research in this. Thank you for that. Um, now we'd like to take just a, a couple of minutes to talk through some different case studies regarding risk and issues associated with implementation of advanced metering infrastructure. It's important to recognize that advanced metering infrastructure, or AMI, can, is continuing to be rapidly deployed throughout the power grid, not only in the United States, but in Europe, and in a number of other countries and continents as well. Um, there is very significant benefit to utilities for deploying advanced metering infrastructure. And we can talk about case studies even in the near term. Uh, recent hurricanes experienced in the United States, both Hurricane Harvey and uh, Hurricane Irma, which is still under, uh, still happening, uh, AMI has provided some very significant benefits in helping utility operators know where the outages are and where to respond. However, it is also very appropriate to recognize that AMI brings with it uh, particular risk, uh, including but not limited to uh, intelligence gathering, um, uh, exfiltration of potentially uh, personal information, uh, potentially even a loss of control. As uh, to, to go a little bit deeper, it's important for entities to recognize that advanced metering infrastructure can introduce new potential points of uh, vulnerability, uh, recognizing that the smart meters themselves can be vulnerable through a number of different ways, including uh, the infrared ports recognizing that there may be vulnerabilities in firmware microcontrollers. Um, it's important to understand, for entities to understand uh, what are the communication methods used between their smart meters and the rest of their infrastructure, whether it is radio or some other type of backhaul network. Um, in addition, it's appropriate for entities to recognize um, what are the points of vulnerability uh, related to AMI head ends um, and other points of concentration for the meters communicating back into the utility system. Um, finally, this, one of the things that's interesting on this slide is to recognize there are potentially attacks available on public telephony networks, 3G, 4G, or even LTE networks. Um, so there are attacks available throughout these spaces. And one of the things that utilities that, and entities implementing AMI is to think carefully through what is happening in different levels of the attack surface uh, what types of risks can be lived with and what types of risks uh, may not be acceptable. Uh, there are certain types of risks, for example, risk to a specific single meter that perhaps somebody can live with. So, for example, uh, an adversary at, at any point in time can, I don't know, take a hammer or a crowbar and attack a single meter. Uh, and this happens from time to time. 
Um, but as a risk, that's not very significant, and it requires a physical presence. However, there are other potential attacks that could uh, affect the operation of multiple meters simultaneously. This requires a little more focus and attention on the part of utilities. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, I'll say, potential countermeasures. Um, and sometimes entities will choose to implement closed or proprietary security solutions. I would suggest that this is not actually a very good long-term strategy. Closed and proprietary security solutions rely upon uh, security through obscurity. And I would suggest that uh, entities would be better served to implement security solutions where, um, where one can assume that the adversary has knowledge, even full knowledge, of the different protocols and measures that are in place. But entities would be better served by implementing security solutions that uh, recognize that adversaries have, have potentially lots of time and even the interest to research and understand. And uh, so, so people should be really looking to implement open standards and architect way solutions that, that can uh, absorb attacks in certain manners. Now let's move to case study two. This case study is uh, more oriented on the side of uh, preventive measures. Basically, when we have uh, a system like the grid system, there is a tight interaction between the control applications and the communication networks, and more in general with physical components. Let's talk about sensor actuators. All this is of paramount importance to assure that the system uh, basically can be introduced in an environment and can basically assure a certain level of risks, which may derive also from new risks, from new components which have been added. In this context, few work has been done in the past uh, to establish where before the adoption of uh, each of the new system. If those systems were secure to be established into the operations, or if any change may have had an impact on the current system. This is part of preventive measures. Now, if we look to this case study and we start analyzing it, basically in a there, there are several controls which could keep the voltage of the grid in a certain range. But we may talk also about frequency and other parameters of the grid. Additional central controllers may have high level objectives like loss min minimization and uh, minimum generator shedding. Now, while most of the systems are quite robust and can work also with weak communication channels, there is no assurance that uh, there is no vulnerability if we will change this status. In this context, basically, we can apply two kinds of measures. One is uh, common ICT security measures, a firewall and a IDP, authentication, strong authentication. Or we may apply what is called system theoretic measures. For example, if we have a model which is based on an attack or a fault de detection isolation, we find strategies to close the loop and to keep stability within the system. Interesting enough, there are several recommendations which are already in place in this direction. Which kind of attacks may alter this system? Attacks may span from uh, attempts to uh, create problems with data integrity, denial of services, distributed denial of services, 
or just an attack in which you may delay signals of the system sending measures. If you look to the, this case study, the interesting part is that if you have a workbench, you may assure that all technical measures are taken into consideration well before it is deployed. Nowadays, anyway, a comprehensive tool in this direction is still not available. So as we said before, if we look to the technical approaches, research is still needed to move on with cybersecurity. This is also part of the task of an engineer when he is developing such a system. And the engineer has, to need, has the need to have an holistic approach, which is based on similar tools and knowledge of which is the underlying systems of the grid. But which are the countermeasures which may use in this case? First of all, as we said before, we need to embed security by design. This is the first big advice that I would give to everybody when you are designing a new system for the grid. Nowadays, we still see systems which come out from the market without very little of security and cybersecurity. This should be embedded. Things like authentication, strong authentication, shouldn't be left as the last feature which is added. There are also ICT measures and control theoretic protection measures that has to work together to properly address anything to a preliminary analysis. This should be a mantra also for procuring your own equipment. When you procure your equipment, you should ask that it has been tested, tested in a workbench, a workbench that you should define and which should have been understood by the provider of the services. Also, some analysis must be performed to the interconnected systems. Sometimes a change cannot be foreseen without testing it beforehand and introducing it into your own grid. And sometimes this phase is skipped just because many people think that testing is just something which can be done on the field, especially when you have very complicated ICT systems. Testing should be part of all this. Let's move to case study three, which most probably is one of the most interesting for most of you. Georgia Institute of Technology re released recently a very interesting academic paper. Uh, they basically built a ransomware, which was able to penetrate into the PLCs of multiple vendors. Due to the weak authentication, basically the system was able to, uh, to lock out any administrator and to install a logic bomb, which was then uh, exploding and creating problems and encrypting the full device. So basically the only solution to recover the device was to flash once again the firmware. There are several examples of similar things. Configure and Stuxnet were mainly based on MS-867, which is an old bug, which basically was giving the opportunity to lock the system just through the remote execution of commands. It is not impossible that a similar virus would be applicable also to the ICS. And this has been seen by the use of WannaCry. The MS-17010 was using the same principle, basically, basically execution of remote commands through a bug which was into the systems. In this case, what you may cause to a system which has a similar vulnerability is mainly problems related to safety, problems related to a critical shutdown, or even worse, it may stop working or it may create physical damages. 
If you go to the website of U.S. CERT and you look for Australia, you will notice that they consider that there was an indicators of compromise about PETIA and that some vendors issued practically notifications or recommendations regarding PETIA ransomware well in advance. You will find it on this link. It is very important because it means that, especially in this case study, it's, it is not so remote that you will be able to implement such an attack. Ransomware is a typical extortion crime. In this case, when you do it on PLCs, for example, it's against a company, instead against a full population of targets. To implement this, it should not be that difficult. And you would find on the market, on the black market, obviously, people who may provide you with the right technology, a Trojan horse, which would inject the ransomware. The Georgia Institute of Technology described also this in the paper and described which is the profit, which in normal circumstances, it would be just the population multiplied value by the value cost, by, by the value of each attack minus the cost. In this case, when you attack the smart grids, it's difficult to evaluate which is on the end the profit for the end user. In smart grids, where data are imperative to continue the business and where any damage may be huge and restoration may be difficult, sometimes even impossible, if you think that you have a number of PLCs and you would need to go physically there just to replace them or simply to, upgrade, to flush the, the firmware, you would understand easily that it's difficult to establish which may be the cost of a similar attack for a company. There are also collateral damage which may include downtime, but which may also harm the equipment health and human safety. Another important thing is that when you have similar ransomware, the negotiation phase may be particularly lengthy because of the financial values which are involved. And this is a crucial point because it may have extreme legal consequences and severe, co severe damages for the company. On Pedia, Petya was used in 2017, and there are abilities to put a single warn that may shut down operating systems and wipe complete systems. Which are the countermeasures? First, endpoint security is one good suggestion. Second, network security, including backups of all configurations that you have on your own network. The adoption of proper policies for software updates is a very good protection, which I would suggest to everybody if you don't have in place, in addition, proper selection of man and management of contractors. Try also to have safeguards to protect information related to your IT and OT equipment. Sometimes this is not done at all. Strict control on change management and supply chain is another big point. And this is something which will be most probably in most of the legislation in future. Isolate and protect vulnerable embedded system, which cannot be patched from potential network exploitation. And finally, engagement with reg regional national defense agencies may be an additional point. Now, if we look to cybersecurity professionals and what are the skills which are needed, as you have seen first, basic skills are IT and OT knowledge. In that knowledge of the security domains, uh, which are mainly 10 in some of them, but in other schemas can be a bit more. Being able to analyze threats in a complex and interconnected infrastructure with limited or partial inputs is something which is very rare nowadays. People always expect to have all information. In the grid, when you have a cyber attack, most of the times you will not have the full set of information when you arrive on the place. Both high-level and low-level knowledge, processes and protocols has to be known to these people. Several 
About certifications, we have several examples. CISSP, CEH, some of them which more the organizational side. The others cover more the technical side. There is a smart grid maturity model navigator, which is a, an example of where to start for certifications. Which are the, the advantages of a certification? First, it sets a baseline for knowledge of the network operators, TSOs and DSOs, as smart grid operators more in general. They build trust among the operators and their own staff. As in aviation, the, into the certification, you may include common knowledge about how to recover, which is known to all the community. Staff can also be recognized as part of the community system. This is an additional point. For the future, if we certify equipment ca which can operate on the grid, why not to certify people? There are several, there are schemas that can be developed for this, and we have to progress fast. We need to create training, awareness campaigns, and extensive cooperation on skills and methods. And let's move finally to regulatory legal constraints in the European Union. Basically, for smart grids, we have the best available techniques developed by uh, the Joint Research Center and the GNR. It establishes techniques to be used in the smart grid to make sure to achieve a certain level of security. It is not a list of comprehensive requirements. It's just a list of techniques which may be used to achieve a level of security or cyber security. National states such as Germany and France have stringent requirements for IT security, which you can easily find on the web, uh, which are, for example, in Germany, set together with a catalog. And finally, we have the data protection regulation, which will be applicable by the 25th May 2018. And there are several efforts at EU level just to coordinate on cybersecurity. Finally, when we deal with standards, we need to deal also in, with international efforts. And we need to make sure that those standards would not jeopardize the work done by the legislation when it was uh, when it was sent out. This is very important, and this is something to be considered. Thank you for that. I, I find it uh, interesting when we take a look at some of the regulatory differences and challenges within Europe. Uh, to a degree, we have some of those same tensions within the United States. There is a legal framework at the federal level for the bulk power system, basically anything at 100,000 volts and above. However, when considering the distribution system, right now in today's world, it is actually controlled by each state or local territory, of which we have 56 related to the United States. So it's, it's, uh, it's very complex and uh, very challenging to arrive at uh, a, a single set of, of uh, ways to go forward. Um, moving forward, uh, sort of my last slide is fundamentally we're, we're looking to employ and use smart grids that have these characteristics. They're secure, they're reliable, and in fact they maintain the security of customer data. They, they will continue to allow for the safe uh, and efficient delivery of electricity to our customers. So with that, Cyril? For conclusion, smart grids are going to grow in complexity and importance, and cyber threats are going to continue. Therefore, we need worldwide a risk management approach to determining how to allocate our funds what best practices to use, how to use the appropriate tools, including computer security incident response teams, and deploy the directives established in Europe and the United States and in countries throughout the world, and to consider maturity models to judge the performance and of your cybersecurity um, posture. And it really is 
cybersecurity is an essential investment. Our civil society depends on the reliable supply of electricity. That has been at least one major attack, and it's going to be a, a long-term issue for all of you on the phone. Security is your responsibility, and it's not going to be a near-term fix. So there's a number of tools, a number of specific frameworks, and best practices you can find on the web for the various countries, and those are ones that need to be utilized worldwide. So we now like to open up to uh, questions of you uh, on the audience. 